As a nation, we Australians have claimed the kangaroo as one of our totems. The kangaroo has been on, the coat of, uh, on our coat of arms since 1908. But have we met our responsibilities to this remarkable animal? Briefly, I'll be providing an overview of the kangaroo industry and the drivers of the commercial killing. I will briefly explain the regulatory framework governing the industry and particularly focus upon the code of practice. Each year, the Commonwealth Government approves the annual kill of approximately four to six million kangaroos. In actual fact, the average number killed is um, around three million each year. However, that is over a 10 year period and um, it does vary from year to year. In 2010, the number was 1.4 million. In addition, whenever a female kangaroo is killed, her dependent young are required to be killed. And um, roughly this equals about 100,000 joeys, again averaged over the 10 year period. As has been previously mentioned, this is the largest commercial kill of land-based wildlife in the world. The commercial killing occurs in remote locations in the Australian outback. Professional shooters work part-time, going out at night solo to shoot kangaroos and come in at the end of their session to bring the carcasses to chillers. Chillers are refrigerated shipping or old shipping containers. The meat is used for pet and human consumption and the hides are used for leather. Although the term kangaroo is commonly used, in actual fact we should be saying macropod um, because there are a number of species that are covered by the industry. Um, on the mainland we have the four um, large kangaroo species but uh, in Tasmania there are, there, there's the wallaby and the patamelon that are also killed. On the mainland, which is where most of the killing occurs, the states that are involved are Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia. <coughs> Historically, kangaroos have been shot due to a perceived need for damage mitigation. Australians have a long history of mass killing of kangaroos. In the 1890s, all of the states of Eastern Australia had legislation to eradicate kangaroos and macropods. Bounties were offered for their heads. While many Australians continue to perceive kangaroos as agricultural pests, a 2004 study by McLeod revealed that the income loss for farmers and graziers from kangaroos is $44 million each year. These costs do not account for the benefits of having kangaroos in the landscape, for example, through fertilising the soils, which may further decrease the perceived costs. Clearly, further cost-benefit analysis is required to provide graziers and farmers with management alternatives for their properties. In terms of commercial value, exports provide the key rev revenue-generating sector of the industry. In 2007, the estimated export value of the kangaroo industry was $77 million. However, since then, things have changed. Russia previously bought 70% of all kangaroo meat exported from Australia, yet suspended imports in August 2009 due to hygiene concerns. Russia cited dangerous, dangerous levels of salmonella and E. coli in kangaroo meat. Former New South Wales Chief Food Inspector Desmond Sibra blamed a lack of industry care in adhering to Australian standards and stated that there is a big difference between animals slaughtered in an abattoir with an inspector present and a kangaroo shot in the bush with dust and blowflies. As a result of the Russian ban and extreme climactic fluctuations ranging from extended drought to flooding, the kangaroo industry has almost collapsed. Recent data suggests that export revenue is now less than $30 million. In recent years, the commercial killing of kangaroos has been promoted as environmentally friendly on the basis that there are too many of them and that perhaps we could um, use them to replace livestock in the landscape. There is no convincing data to support claims of overabundance. Land degradation and biodiversity loss in the rangelands are attributed primarily to the livestock industry. 
In addition, concerns about climate change have highlighted the high levels of greenhouse gas emissions associated with Australia's livestock. At least partial replacement of livestock by free-ranging kangaroos as a product of choice for graziers is touted as a panacea for these significant environmental issues facing Australia. The merit of sheep replacement efforts has been the cause of heated debate as some ecologists question the commercial feasibility of replacing domesticated livestock with kangaroos. If every Australian had, which is currently around 21 million people, had one portion of kangaroo meat a week, at a conservative upper estimate of 12 kilograms um, acceptable meat per carcass, a total of 22 million kangaroos would need to be killed each year. Assuming an average take of 15% of the population over each year, we would need 151 million kangaroos in the landscape. This is about 5.6 times the 30-year average of 27 million kangaroos in the commercial zones. Clearly, it is unfeasible. The, reg the kangaroo industry is regulated by a complex regulatory framework. The state governments have primary responsibility in this regard. Generally, it is an offence to kill or harm kangaroos and other wildlife which are protected fauna. The commercial killing is provided for through the issuing of, of licences. The Commonwealth Government regulates the export of kangaroo products through the EPBC Act. In accordance with this legislation, state governments develop kangaroo management plans which are guided by the National Management Plan and need to be approved by the Commonwealth Minister. There was previously a right to appeal of these approvals, however this right has since been removed. A key regulatory instrument is the National Code of Practice which sets out the standards for shooters as they kill kangaroos. In and of itself, the code is not enforceable. However, it is incorporated to various levels through the legislation um, of the various states and compliance is generally a condition of the commercial licences. The key provisions of the code relate to the targeting of the animal in the brain, the killing of misshot kangaroos, or injured kangaroos, and the killing of dependent young. I'll be going through each of these. Shooters are required to aim for a shot to the brain, which is generally accepted to result in a sudden and painless death for the kangaroo. A diagram is shown here which shows the location of the brain and is included in the code of practice. As you'll see, the, the brain is actually quite a small target relative to the size of the kangaroo's head. A shot in the neck or other parts of the head, such as the jaw, will likely not result in a sudden or painless death. Studies have been undertaken to determine to what extent this objective is achieved, is it, has been achieved. These studies have been undertaken by RSPCA Australia and Animal Liberation New South Wales. These studies have looked at whether kangaroos have been shot in the head. None of these studies have looked at whether they've been shot in the brain. In 1985, the RSPCA found that 86% of processed kangaroo carcasses were headshot. In 2000-2002, the RSPCA found that this figure had risen to 95.9% of processed kangaroos. Clearly, there had been an improvement. In 2005-2008, Animal Liberation conducted a study and found that um, of carcasses at Chillers, there was 40%, about 40% of carcasses had been shot in the neck. There is obviously a, a substantial difference between these results. It appears that a key difference in methodology has um, resulted in a significant variation in the results. The RSPCA identified neck shots directly as entry bullet holes in or below the neck. However, Animal Liberation identified neck shots as those whose heads were uh, severed, severed sorry, um, below the occipital joint, which is a location where it's more difficult to make a cut. The argument here is that a shooter would be unlikely to make such a difficult cut unless they were 
um, trying to conceal a neck shot. It appears that the animal liberation study may have identified neck shot carcasses that were overlooked by the RSPCA. However, all of these study, studies are limited by the fact that they were only taken at processes and chillers, not actually in the field. Presumably, shooters will only bring in carcasses that either comply or close to comply with the regulations. Thus, these studies only provide an insight into the number of carcasses that have been not shot um, correctly and then sold on. They do not tell us how many of the kangaroos have been misshot in the field. The second aspect in terms of the killing of misshot kangaroos is also equally important. The code provides that if a kangaroo has been misshot, was injured but not killed, the shooter must make every reasonable effort to locate and kill the kangaroo before shooting another animal. There is ambiguity around what is required of shooters in terms of this um, part of the code, and the code should be amended to specify what steps are required. Clearly, the, the term reasonable leaves quite a lot of room for interpretation. No studies have been undertaken to determine what actually occurs in the field. The killing of dependent young is perhaps the most heated of the animal welfare issues in, in the kangaroo industry. Dependent young must be euthanized in accordance with the methods provided in the code of practice. These methods vary depending upon the age and stage of the animal. Third pouch young are to be killed by a forceful blow to the base of the skull sufficient to destroy the functional capacity of the brain. In practice, this could include a blow by a steel water pipe or the tow bar of a vehicle. The American Veterinary Medical Associ Association report on euthanasia stated that personnel performing physical methods of euthanasia, such as a blow to the head, must be well trained and monitored for each type of physical technique performed. However, no formal training is provided for the killing of dependent young in Australia, and these practices are virtually unmonitored. Furthermore, the RSPCA found that young at foot were difficult to catch and often left alive. Even if caught, shooters found it difficult to kill young at foot, which are to be killed by shooting. If left behind, these dependent young are likely to die from exposure, dehydration, predation or starvation. There are clear and strong parallels between the kangaroo industry and the Canadian harp seal industry. The ends or drivers of these industries are commercial in terms of employment and having products, a desire to control populations and mitigate apparent damage caused by kangaroos and seals, and some argue that there are environmental benefits from killing them. The industries involve the killing of wild animals, and methods include shooting and a blow to the head. Finally, there are significant animal welfare concerns with both industries, particularly in relation to injured animals and unnecessary suffering. However, perhaps the strongest parallel is that it is virtually impossible for state agencies to ensure compliance in the field. There are, if we compare this to abattoirs, there are as many points of kill as what there are animals. Whereas in an abattoir, we have one centralised location that can be subject to inspections. Such options are not available for either of these industries. The future of the kangaroo industry is uncertain. The industry is struggling. Despite industry and government attempts to raise hygiene standards, Russia's borders remain closed to kangaroo meat. The costs of kangaroos to farmers and graziers are less than expected and the supposed environmental, environmental benefits of eating kangaroos are questionable. There are options for reform to improve animal welfare outcomes. Heads could be left on carcasses to aid the identification of whether carcasses have actually been shot in the brain. A male-only kill could be introduced to prevent suffering by dependent young. However, no government agencies carry out inspections at the point of kill. This makes it impossible to regulate aspects of the code of practice, including what happens to misshot kangaroos. 
Clearly, Australians are not meeting their responsibilities to these sentient beings. The legitimacy of com commercial kill should be re-evaluated on <coughs> both necessity and ethical considerations. Finally, I would like to finish with a call for lawyers to find ways of reconciling compassion and conservation. For too long, animal protection law and environmental law have remained separate. Increasingly, science is recognising that the need to protect, to respect all of the human and animal communities that make up our world. It is our responsibility to ensure that compassionate conservation is found in the law. Thank you.